Miami with Ruby. Before I start, I want to ask you some, some questions. So I, I assume that all of you are Groovy developers, right? Yes? And how many of you know what is metaprogramming? OK, most of you. And how many of you have used metaprogramming in your programs? OK, a few. Yeah. So in this talk, what I'm going to show you is what is metaprogramming. Uh, Groovy provides two different kinds of, of metaprogramming techniques, runtime and compile time metaprogramming. I'm going to talk almost all the time about runtime metaprogramming, although I'm going to do talk a little bit at the end about uh, compile time metaprogramming. And I'm going to show you the different techniques with a lot of examples. I'm going to explain at the beginning some theory, but I'm going to show you a lot of code. Because, uh, you know, I, I, we, we're developers, and I, I know, or I think that we all love to see code. Uh, but don't worry about the code. I'm going to push all the code to GitHub, so you, you will have the code available to, to play with it and, and run it. Right? So before I start, let me introduce myself. Hello, I'm, I'm Ivan Lopez at Elomar on Twitter. I work at Kaleidos as a Groovy developer. I've been using Groovy since last, I think, six, maybe seven years now. We, Kaleidos, as a, we are a technological company based in Madrid in Spain. And we almost use uh, Groovy and the whole stack and the whole ecosystem to do our, 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 our projects. I'm the coordinator of the Madrid Groovy user group, our local Groovy group in, in Madrid. We have meetup, meetups once a month. And I think we are one of the biggest, if not the biggest, Groovy user group in the world. Uh, we started uh, five years ago, I think, uh, with five, eight, ten people. Now we have something between 40, 60, maybe even 80 people in, in every meetup. So we, I'm really, really happy. If you, come, if you come to Madrid sometime, please join us. And I'm also one of the organizers of the Grich conference with Alberto Vilches. Grich is a conference just like this one. It's the, the other Groovy conference in Europe. And our last edition was last April. It was the fifth one. And you have all the information. All the videos are available. Some of the speakers that are here now, we are, we, they were in, in Madrid in two months ago. And I have these t-shirts from Grid. I have three now here. If you do, at the end, some questions, you can grab one. And I'm going to give a talk tomorrow, and I will have more t-shirts for you. OK, so let's stop talking about me, and, and let's, talk, let's start talking about the talk. So Groovy is a dynamic language. And with a dynamic language, we can delay, we can postpone some decisions, some checks, some things that we usually, or the compiler usually do during compilation time. But we can postpone them to runtime. And with these things, we can add new properties, new methods, uh, new behavior to, to our code during runtime. And we can create different things or different kinds of application. We can create DSLs, builders, some logging or tracing tools. And with, with this, or because of this dynamism and all the metaprogramming things, things, we can organize maybe our code base better because we can solve problems in a different way than if we were using a, a static uh, compile, compile language. And this is why we can talk about metaprogramming with, with Groovy. But what really is it's metaprogramming? So imagine that if we could add methods, uh, behavior, dynamically to our code based on its current state uh, on the inputs the application will receive. With this, we, we can make our code more flexible and we can be more creative and, and productive. Well, let me tell you something. This already exists and it's called metaprogramming. So if we go to the Wikipedia, we can read this definition. Metaprogramming is the writing of computer programs that write or manipulate other programs or themselves as their data. And this is a really important part, as their data. So we can say something like, we write code that writes code, right? So now in this part, uh, I'm going to talk about runtime metaprogramming. And with this kind of techniques, we can postpone to runtime some decisions. We can intercept the execution. We can inject new methods, new behavior, or even synthesize new methods on the fly during, during runtime. But how it works? Well, Groovy provides this meta object protocol layer, this mob. And, and we can use this, this mob layer, or, or Groovy use, this dynamic Groovy use, this mob layer, 
to invoke methods dynamically. And we can hook into this layer to just do all these, all these things. So it's important with this graphic, it's important to understand that when the Ruby compiler compiles our code, it generates bytes code that will dispatch the, the method execution through this mob layer. And it doesn't matter if we uh, are calling Groovy code or Java code from Groovy. All the calls are always done through this mob layer. And we can hook into this layer. And on the other hand, if we use Java and we call Groovy or Java code, the, the execution or the dispatch is always done to the final, to the direct method. Okay? And we also need to talk about a meta class. So for, for every class in, in the class loader, the Groovy maintains this, this object of, of type meta class. It's, it's something like a, it's like a registry with a collection of all the methods and properties of every class. And it's useful because sometimes we cannot modify another class because it's, it, it came from an external library. It's not our code. Or it's, it is a, a Java code. So for example, imagine about Java lang string. It's, Java, it's a Java class, and as you know, a string is a final class. So from a Java developer point of view, we cannot do anything with, with, with a string class. But with the meta class, we can, al or we can always modify the meta class of the string class, and we can do some things that I'm going to show you in, in, the, next, in the next slides. So let's uh, start with the first techniques, uh, this mob injection, method injection. We are going to to add new methods or new behavior dynamically, and we are going to change the behavior of, of our code. So, as I said, we are, going, we are going to inject methods, and with these techniques, we know the names of the new methods that we want to add at um, code writing time, right? So I want to inject this method. I know that the name is foo, and I'm going to inject that method. And as I said, we can always open any class, because we can Groovy doesn't care too much about is a Java class or is final because the dispatch is always done through this mob layer and this meta class. And we are going to see these techniques, the meta class, categories, extensions, and mixing versus traits. So let's uh, start with, with the meta class. I'm pretty sure that most of you have something like this, some classes, utils, helper classes with uh, static methods. So I have here this truncate method. It receives a string a length and an optional overflow uh, parameter. And it's, this method will truncate the, this string, and if the overflow parameter is true, it will print these three little dots, these ellipses, at the end. You can use, for example, this, this method to, if you have uh, a, a blog post with comments, maybe you don't want to, to just render a very, very big comment when you load the page, so you can use this to truncate uh, the comments, I don't know, to. 200 characters, and then just load the rest on the background. And with this class, we have also Chuck Ipsum. If you can see Chuck Norris, he can see you. If you cannot see Chuck Norris, you might be only seconds away from death. So be careful, because we cannot see Chuck Norris now. And we can use this, this class, as, as you can see, a string utils dot truncate with the different parameters. And it will just print what you expect. The first one will truncate, and the second one with the overflow param true, print this ellipses. But we are using Groovy, and Groovy is dynamic, and we can, do, we can improve this code. So we can do something like this. We can modify the meta class of the string. Remember, Java lang string. With this implementation, it's pretty much the same as the previous one. So we receive the length and the overflow. And in this case, the delegate is the instance in which we are executing the method. So basically, the same implementation. And now, with this small modification on the meta class of the string class, we can just execute that method on an instance of a string. Now, this, me this method is available. So you can, we, we can now uh, run chakipsum.truncate. And it will work, and it will be the same as if, you use, if we use the, uh, the other static method, right? OK, we can also add new properties to the meta class. So imagine this example. We have this empty class, and we can create a new instance. And we can add a new property named version to the class, meta class. 
but we can also add a new property to the instance, right? And now we can check that the instance have both properties available. And it doesn't matter if first we created the instance and then we just modify the meta class of the class. Now the instance has these properties available. Okay? And the other thing that we can do is overwrite methods using the, the meta class. So first we can check that the 42, the string 42, it's equals to 42 dot to a string. But as you probably know, 42 is also the answer to life, the universe, and everything. So we can do something like this. We can overwrite the to a string implementation of the integer class. And if the value is 42, we are going to return the answer to, the, to life, the universe, and everything. And if not, we will just return the, the string value of, of that integer. So with this modification, we can now check this. Now, the to a string of 42 is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And with the rest of the number, it will be the, the, the expected value, right? And we can do it even better or worse. <laughs> so we can check that false to Boolean, it's false. But we can also change it. So now we just return the opposite value. So now false to Boolean is true. So yeah, it's something like, whoa. And you can, do, you can use this to troll your colleagues, but you shouldn't. Imagine if you put this, this change of the to Boolean method on some part of the code on the bootstrap, and you generate, for example, a random number between 0 and 1, and 80% of the times you return the right value, but the, 20, the, the rest of the time you return the opposite. So imagine what would happen running your test. Most of the time, your test will pass, and sometimes you will have this strange behavior. So please be nice with your colleagues. Don't do that, right? You can, but it doesn't mean that you should do it. OK. And now we are going to talk about categories. So all the changes that we do to this meta class thing are persistent, are really, really hard to revert. And sometimes we want to just modify the meta class in a confined space of, uh, in, a, in a small uh, piece of code. So with, with a category, we can just modify the meta class inside of a closure. And after we uh, exit the, the closure, the, the meta class changes that we have done are revert back to the original state. OK? So I'm going to show you the, the same example the, with this, this string utils um, uh, class with this static method truncate. And now we can use that class with this keyword used as a category. So inside that closure, any string, and it's a string because it needs to be the first parameter. That this is why the Groovy compiler know that we want to modify the meta class of the string because of the first parameter. So inside this closure, all the strings have this truncate method available. But outside that of that closure, all the changes are reverted. So now if we try to execute truncate on a string, it will throw mes missing method exception because all changes has been reverted back to the original state. So this is a way that you can use to just modify in this small piece of code and not affecting all of your code, OK? Another use of categories is this one. We can use this time category from Groovy, so we can get 20 hours plus another time category, get days, get 10 days from now. So it will print something like this. And with this example, uh, you can see that the API, it's not really readable. But we can use this time category class. So the, the, the basic idea is that you can use a class as a, as a category, and all the uh, public static methods are available inside the category, right? So we can use as a category, and now we can write the, uh, the code in this way, 20 dot hours plus 10 days from now. It's way more readable. And it's, it's basically the same because, as you know, if you, for example, call get days, you can just call it dot days in Groovy or from now, or the plus is overloaded, so you can just use it that way. But I think that it's, it's more readable, so you, you need to think uh, about categories in this way. So the first one is to 
modify the meta class in, in a small piece of code, and the other one it's probably to improve uh, an API or to use to write the code in, in a different way, uh, taking advantage of, of a class that already exists as it is time category, uh, that it's available from Groovy, Groovy time, time category. Okay. And now let's talk a little bit about extension modules. So sometimes uh, it's useful not to modify the source code of, with this meta class or with this use category, or maybe we can't do it because it's not our code. So with this technique, with this extension module, what we are going to create is uh, it's uh, something like a category and an additional meta information file, and we are going to pack all these things in a jar, and you only need to put that jar on the class path. And the Groovy compiler or the Groovy runtime will know how to apply this class based on the meta information file to all your code, right? So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty simple. Once that you have created that, you just put on your class path. You don't need to worry about that. So we can see again the same example, this truncate method. It's the same implementation, but as I need to create a jar with this, I have created a, a small Gradle project, so I need to put this in, in the standard source main Groovy di directory. And then I need to define this meta information file. This file needs to be in this directory, resource meta inf services. This is the name of the file. And the important part here is the last one, extension classes. This is just a name and a version. And the last one is the comma separated values of all the classes that you want to export as a module, as, a, as an extension module. So you can pack those, those files as a, as a jar. And now imagine, for example, that you have this jar on the class path. You can write this Spock test. And as you can see here, I'm not modifying the meta class. I am not doing this, this category, this use thing. I am just executing the truncate method on the, on the string class. And this method exists because I have the other jar file on the class path, right? So if you want to play with it, with, with the code, one, once I push it, you, you just need to execute Gradle build to create the jar, and you can just run the example with Groovy and passing that jar on the class path, and with this, with this extension example one Groovy, this asset will be true. If you execute the same code just with Groovy extension example one, it will fail, because it will throw again a, a method missing exception, okay? Yes? Um, in which of this code is the connection to the string class? So how do I know that I only uh, can Here. string and not something else? No, it's the same. So it's the first parameter. Ah, okay. It's the same as a category, and you are just declaring here the, um, the class that you want to export as a, as a module. The class that I yeah. Yeah. So it's always the first parameter? Yes. It's the first parameter. Yes? Yeah, well, very good question. Now, all these techniques are based on dynamic Groovy. So if you add a compile static, it's not dynamic anymore. So all those techniques won't work, right? I'm not really sure. Maybe in some cases, so the meta class won't work. Maybe this should work. We need to try it or ask Frederick. Yeah? Yes? Okay, perfect. So we can use it in a compile. Perfect, thank you. No, you create a jar file, so here is a, a string extension 1.0 jar, and this jar contains the class, the compiled version of this code, and this file. Put it on the class path. Okay, so we can have the jar on the class path. Yeah. It will look for this. That's why you need to declare this, this special file to, yeah, it will scan all those files to create these extension modules. Okay. okay. 
Yeah, I'm not really sure. Okay, more questions? Okay, so let's move on to mixings. With mixings, we can uh, mix or bring in uh, multiple implementations from different classes to, to the, our target class. And when, when we invoke a method, the Groovy is going to call first the, that method on the mixing classes. And if the method doesn't exist on the mixing, uh, the target class will handle it. And we can add multiple classes as, as mixings. And if those classes has the same method with the same signature, the last one wins. And as with uh, metaclass modification, the mixings are not easily undone, right? So now we have this new example. Imagine this class, spider power, and you have this method, a spider sense, that gets return using a spider sense. We can just mix in that class into this person class, which now it's, it's, an, it's an empty class. We can create an instance, and we can now check that the person has a spider sense, right? But, this is important, this person class is not an instance of the mixing class. And we can, do, we can use this at mixing annotation if we can modify this, this class, but imagine that we cannot modify it because it's not our code. We can now, imagine we have this, another, this other class, Superman Power, that can fly. We can just add a mixing to another class, calling this a static method, person.mixing, and a comma separated values of classes that we want to use as a mixing. So now this person can fly, uh, has a spider sense, which is awesome, but is not an instance of superpower. And I don't know what do you think about this mixing thing with this example, but let me tell you something. They have been deprecated. So, I'm sorry. This is a quote from last year from Grit. Jochen was there and he gave the, the keynote speak uh, talk and he said something like this. When we started fixing mixing bugs, we didn't know if they were a bug or a feature. So at the end, we removed mixings or we forget about it and implemented traits. The thing with, with, mixing, with mixings is that, uh, as he said, there are some corner cases and they weren't sure if it was a bug or a feature. So the, the, and it has some performance problems and issues. So they introduced traits, right? So traits were introduced in Groovy 2.3. They are similar as Java 8 default method with the interfaces with uh, default uh, method implementations. But the nice thing is that if you want to use that Java 8 default methods, you need to use Java 8. But how many of you are using Java 8 on production now? Oh, half. So if you use Java 6, 7, or 8, you can use traits in your code to improve it. They are stateful, and this is a really powerful feature. And they favor this composition over inheritance, because sometimes we tend to have this, um, if we want to share some code, the first thing that comes to our mind is, OK, I'm going to create this class, and I'm going to extend from this class. And this class will extend from whatever. But at the end, you have in this class a lot of methods that they are not the same, uh, they are not related, but you need to put them. So with traits, you can have these methods in different traits and just supply the, the traits that you really need. And the last, the last thing is a, a link to the Groovy documentation about, about traits. So let's convert the previous uh, mixing example to, to use traits. So now we have this new keyword, trait, and the rest of the code is exactly the same. But now the person implements the trait, right? And the nice thing now is that the person is an instance of that trait. And from a Java point of view, as we are implementing that trait, the Java code can see that. And again, if we don't want or can't modify the class, we can just execute this with traits method. And now this person can also fly. Okay? And yes? Is it also the last one yes. I mean, there are some cases. Um, the documentation about traits, it's really good. There are some corner cases, not, not corner cases, some special cases because you can have more than one trait with the same implementation and you can have, this is something like uh, multiple inheritance, 
you can have the diamond problem and everything is, a, is, is really, really well explained on, on the documentation. So, and they are um, compiled static compatible. Yes? Uh, modifying the existing class or without? I annotate the class without mixing in the first example, but in the second one I use the person.mixing static method. Yeah, it's the same person with traits and I add the traits. Yeah? So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so now, let's talk about uh, method synthesis. With these techniques, we are going to dynamically figure out behavior of these methods upon invocation, uh, and we are going to to. Um, to create now, we are, go we are going to create new methods on the fly, and we don't know the name of that method when we write the code. Okay? We are going to just generate it on the fly. We are going to do this intercept, cache, and invoke pattern, and we are going to sheet. So the first is some helpers methods. Imagine that we have this class, person, name, and age, and two methods, say hi, and say hi to, that receive a, a, a string parameter. We create a new instance, a new person, and we can check with this response to that the person responds to that method because we have this say hi to method with, without parameters. And we also have this say hi to with an string parameter, which is this one. But the person doesn't respond to goodbye because this method doesn't exist. And we can also check properties. So the person has this age property, but uh, it doesn't have this um, uh, country property, right? So what I'm going to show you now, it's, uh, it's a real use case. We, we were developing, uh, I think, three years ago, uh, an application with Grails. It was a social network. And we need to implement a uh, um, messaging and notification system for the users on the application. We needed to develop um, more than 50 different uh, notifications. And we have different channels. So a channel is, for example, sending you a notification by mail, by uh, internal notification within the app, or a push notification to your mobile phone. We want to create a solution um, extensible, so we don't, need, we don't want it to modify every application or the whole notification system with a, with a new, no, every time we need to add a new, a new notification. And we also, another requirement was that for Different notification, we only want, for example, use one channel. So maybe if you receive a new message, you will receive this notification the, using the three channels. But if you have a new follower, for example, you will only receive an email. And we develop this part of the application using this missing method technique, this, syn this um, method synthesis, synthesis thing. So what we did first was create this channel, and we in this abstract class, we implemented all of notifications with just an end implementation. And then we created a new class for every channel. In this example, I'm going to show you just email and mobile push. And in this channel, we overwrite the implementation that we want to send. So for example, send new follower. If I want to send this notification, I'm going to use to send it by email and by mobile push because it's on both uh, channels, but send new message will, will only be sent by the email channel, right? So with this approach, if we tomorrow or another day we want to just add this notification in this channel, we only need to do it here. And the, the, the next thing we did was, was create this notification service. This is a Grails class, and this is the whole code of all, all the class. So first we have this list of channels that Spring will inject, in, in, during runtime. And then we define this method missing. 
So if you implement method missing on your, on your class, this method will catch all the uh, method execution on this class that doesn't exist. Because what we wanted to do was execute this, this code. So from the rest of the application, we just want to, to call this, this method just like this, notification service dot send new follower. And under the hood, it will send the notification using the channels that we have configured, but we don't want it to just need it to call the different notification, so then different channels outside this notification service. So as you can see, this send new follower, this send new message doesn't exist on this class. But this method missing will catch it, will intercept this, this call. So this is the implementation I'm going to try to explain. It's not that simple. So first we print method missing call for the name of the method and the arguments. And then we are going to generate a new implementation on the fly. So here, the implementation, we are, we are returning a closure, right? And for every channel that we have here, and remember, during runtime, this channel list will have the three channels. We are going to get the current implementation of this notification from the, from the channel. And we are going to return the invocation of the code. So we are not executing the, the code in this moment. We are going to just return the implementation in, in, in this closure. So the next, we have intercepted the execution. We are created an implementation on the fly. And we are going to cache this implementation. So we, this is a, this notification service. And we just add this, this in, in name here, we have the name of the method. So we just add the, the method on the meta class with this, with this implementation. And the last step is just invoke it. So it's, it's, a, it's a closure, so we can just invoke it. And with this code, you have everything now. So let me show you an example how you can use this. The first thing you need to do is create a new instance of this notification service. This is a standalone example that you can run, run that's Groovy and the name of the class. So you don't need to, in, in, if you use Grails, you don't need to pass the, the list of channels because Spring will do that for you. But in this standalone example, you need to do it. And the first thing we want to check is that uh, this, the, the notification service does not respond to send new follower. The, me the method doesn't exist yet. Now we call the method. And method missing will intercept this method missing execution. And you can see here, this is the print that we show in the previous example. So method missing call for send new follower with these parameters. And then we have created the implementation. We catch and we execute that implementation. So this is the, the, the implementation because remember in the previous example, in the previous slide, send new follower is implemented in both channels with just this print line, right? And so this is the output of the sending the notification. And now we can check that the method is already there. So if we execute the method, the same method again, now we don't have this method missing call because now it exists. So we are only paying the price of this dynamism the first time that we call a method. But then we, we catch that method on the meta class and now it's already there. Okay, and if we execute the other, the other notification, set new message, but it, it will be the same. We catch it, we intercept cache, and then invoke it. This, this is this intercept cache and invoke thing. Um, the first time the Groovy community did that, it was Graham, and in, I think it was in Grails one point something. And, and he actually invented this thing because dynamic finders by that way in Grail, so you have a domain class user and you can execute find user or find by name and last name. This is a dynamic finder. And in those versions of, of Grails, they were uh, developed in, in this, using this, this technique. Okay, that was about runtime metaprogramming. So now let's talk a little bit about compile time metaprogramming. This is the, the other thing that we can, this is the other kind of big techniques that we have available in Groovy uh, relative to metaprogramming. So this compile time metaprogramming, it's, it's an advanced feature. It's not used every day and it's used mostly in, in frameworks, libraries or something like that, although you can use in your code. 
And, and with this compile time thing, we can uh, modify or analyze the program at compile time, right? We can implement uh, different features, uh, inspect classes for threat safety, uh, generate load messages, uh, perform some pre-checks or post-checks after or before the execution of our code. So with these techniques, we are writing code that generates bytecode, or at least this code will be involved during uh, bytecode generation. So let's talk a little bit about AST. AST is abstract syntax tree, and when the Groovy compiler tries to compile our code, it will read the code from the file, and it will create this in-memory tree, this abstract syntax tree, and in the different phases, uh, the compiler we, we will rearrange these these nodes on the on the on the tree. We add new nodes. We'll remove the nodes, and at the end, it will convert this tree to the final bytecode. So with these techniques, we can hook into these different phases of the compiler. These are the nine phases of the Ruby compiler, and we can just modify that tree. And with this modification, we are modifying the final bytecode that it's going to be generated. These are the phases, and conversion, semantic analysis, and canonicalization are usually the phases that you, as a developer of an of a AST, will most, uh, we use most of the time. OK, and we have different, two different kinds of transformation. We have global AST transformations. So they are global, so you don't need to annotate anything in your code, and the Ruby compiler will apply those transformations when it is, when, when it tried to, co to compile your code. And as they are global, you need to define a, a meta information file just to declare it. And a little warning about global AST transformations. As I said, they are applied every time you compile your Groovy code. So if you have a lot of AST, global AST transformations, or they are of, if they are very complex, your compilation time or your it will be a slow, or it can be a slow, but don't worry, it won't be as slow as a Scala. But it, 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 you, you need to think that in mind, right? And you can apply this global transformation to any phase of the compiler. Of the compiler. And on the other hand, we have local AST transformations. And as they are local, we need to annotate the code. So Groovy provides out of the box, I think, more than 50 AST transformations at to string at uh, immutable, at delegate, uh, equals and has code. There are a lot of them. But you can, all, you can create your own, your, own, um, AST your own local AST transformation if you want. The, the thing is that they are more, you don't need this meta information file because they are local. You are modifying your code with the annotation. And they are easy to debug. And the, the steps you need to do to create a, a local AST transformation is just define an interface, implement the AST, and enjoy. It's pretty simple, right? So let's see uh, a very basic or a really simple AST transformation. On the left side, you have the code. And I want to develop this or to create this at version annotation. And I want that this annotation generate that this, this byte code. Public static final string version with that value 1.0, right? But I don't want to write this public static final thing. As I said, this is uh, pretty simple. So the first thing is just create, create an interface. It's just a regular Java interface. The only different thing is this, this interface is annotated with Groovy AST transformation class. Here we are declaring in which class we are implementing this at version annotation, right? And this is the code of the AST transformation. So the first thing you need to do is just extend from this abstract AST transformation. Here you define in which of the phases of the compiler you want to hook, and depending on the thing that you want to try, you need to hook into different phases. And you just need to override this visit method. And the compiler will call this visit method when, we, when it tries to compile your, your class annotated with, with this at version uh, annotation. So you need to do some checks. So for example, the, the first node, so they are nodes because it's a tree with, with a nodes. You can add nodes, remove nodes, do all that stuff. So the first node, it's, a, it's an annotation node. And the second, it needs to be a class because you are annotating classes in, in this example. And here you can get the value of this, of this annotation that you have written, so 1.0. And you, for example, wanted to check that this value, it's a constant expression because I want to just write 
1.0, no another variable, for instance. And if this is true, what you are going to do is add a new field to this node. This is the name version. It's going to be public, static, final. It's going to be a string and with this value. And if not, you are going to add an error. And it will, this will be a, a compilation error because you are, this, is a, this code is executed during compile time. If you put this, this code and put a breakpoint, uh, for example, with IntelliJ and compile the code, IntelliJ will break there and the debugger will, will stop on that code during the compilation time. So now with this, with this code, you, you just pack, if you want this AST transformation on a jar file, put on the class path, and you can annotate a, um, a, a class, an empty class, and execute print version, dot, version class dot version, and it will just print 1.0. And if you don't believe me, you can just compile this code and decompile the generated dot class file and open it with, for example, UDGuy. And you will see that in the generated bytecode, this is bytecode, you have this method available. So this is a, a pretty simple example. You can look if you want to have the, the, the source code of the annotations that Groovy provides you. Some of them are more easy to, to learn or to, to look at. Some others are really, really complicated. And yeah, so. At the end, why we should use metaprogramming? Well, so let's, let's talk, uh, let's summarize the talk. So uh, we have metaprogramming out of the box because Groovy is dynamic, or if we use dynamic Groovy, we can use most of these things. Uh, most of the techniques are easy to use and they are very powerful. You can solve problems in a different way. You can write better code because uh, for example, you, if you create an uh, AST transformation, you can do a lot of things that, in, in, uh, that are applied all over your code, and you don't need to worry about doing all the checks in every method or every business logic you create. Uh, we can add behavior easily with some cases, for example, modifying the meta class or with these extension modules. And we, we can take advantage of all this power that Groovy provides us as a developer, so we can write Groovy code, yes, uh, Java code. But if we are Groovy developer, we should take advantage of all of this. And at the end, because you know Groovy, it's Groovy. So if you are only going to remember one thing after this talk, please do remember this. With metaprogramming, you have a great power. But as you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So please use metaprogramming Use, but use wisely, enjoy, and at the end, have fun. So thank you very much. This is my contact information. I'm going to post the slides and, and the code to GitHub. I'm going to tweet about it. And if you have something like 30 seconds in this QR code and in this URL, it's, a, it's a, an, an anonymous Google form to send me some feedback about the talk. It's only four questions. So if you, it's a, as I said, it's anonymous, so you can say whatever you want. If you like the talk, please let me know. If you don't like the talk or you have some ideas or some things that I need to improve, just let me know. If you think that it was, I don't know, crap, let me know. It's anonymous. And now I think we have some, question, some time for, for questions. Yes? The global AST transformation are applied during the compilation. Okay. So are applied during your code when, when the compiler com compiles that code. Yes? So the question is, if you want to intercept all methods like Yeah, you can create a, a, a global transformation, maybe, to do this uh, aspect-oriented thing, to intercept some method that match some patterns, probably. But maybe you can use, uh, I don't know, Spring AOP or something like that. Depends on, on the problem that you try to solve, or if you are using now, if you are, on, for example, on a Spring Boot on a, or on a Grails application, you already have a Spring there, so maybe it's easier to, to use AOP that create a global ST transformation. Okay, more questions? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>